Uh, thank you. Can you, you can hear me, yes? Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited about this talk. As Jackie asked me to make this talk a few months ago, I thought, well, I, I could do this. And uh, I'm a physicist, and <clears throat> I thought, well, I, you'll find that uh, it, it removes a lot of my physics and puts back my earlier life, which was a philosophy major. And you'll identify that I have a passion for art and music. <clears throat> and you'll see this clearly in this talk. <clears throat> uh, basically, I, I've illustrated here, uh, if anyone can recognize it, it's from a children's book. Uh, this is Swimmy. And he identifies himself among a group of other fish, which are very similar. And uh, it, it's, in many ways, a very good illustration of the broken symmetry that we all have in our lives, the individual that we are, and the, the world and the universe that we look at. Um, so um, when I made this talk, it was a lot of fun. And I thought to myself, um, where is it going? I, I, I wanted to illustrate some of the, the simplest ideas of, of, of symmetry and where physicists and mathematicians, but I think that's the more boring part. The real essence is how it breaks and how we break it and how, as we are just people in this universe, how, how do we respond to the universe that deterministically gives us all of these laws, geometrically or physically? And uh, representing yourself as that individual, there are two parts of this talk that you really should come away with, is distinguishability and, and differentiability. And those are the kinds of things that we get from symmetry and how it breaks. So keep those in your mind as we go through this talk. And uh, I think it'll be quite interesting to you. So this is the more mundane part of the talk. How do we develop symmetries? Well, I'm not in a theory environment. I'm an experimentalist. So I had to kind of figure out my own work in this area. Uh, basically, we've defined symmetries from the way we move things around or rotate them, or translate them in time. And uh, we can look at uh, something like tiles on the floor, which you see often in Santa Fe. And uh, you don't see initially what's going on here, but mathematically, we call that a translation. And we can define a certain kind of symmetry based on what we do to objects in them. And the same thing can occur with rotation. You can take an object, in this case, like an orange slice, and rotate it about once every eight eighth of a full turn, and you recover exactly what it was before. And we can define symmetries based on rotations in that, in that same way. Uh, here's an illustration of a tulip, which uh, you've probably seen these around town. Uh, it's a, a wind sculpture, and of course it has symmetry too. Every sixth of a turn, it's essentially the same object that it was. Now, the next form of symmetry, I'm just kind of almost walking through a Wikipedia page here, but I'm giving some extra stuff, and uh, is handedness. And physicists really need handedness because we need to define the universe in ways which either we represent it right-handed or left-handed, which coordinate system. It's very important for NASA to get this right, of course, when you're sending probes to Mars. If you get it wrong, you, 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 you send the probe to its death, early death, um, which has happened. Um, it turns out that nature has to be handed because as soon as you form molecules like water, it becomes arranged in a certain way that's not symmetric in every rotation or translation. And this gives rise to incredibly complex patterns. And all of the proteins are essentially uh, formed in this way in our bodies. And some of you may or may not know the internet sensation Jeremy. He was a mollusk. Uh, he was found in a garden in Britain. And do, does anyone notice what's interesting about him? His shell curves counterclockwise. Not only did his shell curve counterclockwise, but all of his internal organs were left-sided. So that meant he couldn't mate. So everyone, they were singing ballads about Jeremy, he could never find love. And <laughs> it turns out that uh, about one in a million mollusks like this uh, could be left-handed. They found one in Spain. 
Uh, it, was, it was a big thing. So the, they brought him to, to England. Now, this is actually interesting from a genetic point of view because it was a mutation that gave him this. And they wanted to study his progeny. I think, from what I understand, they were all right-handed. There were hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, even though his spouse was also left-handed. In any case, I find reflection uh, very metaphorically and, and, and literally the most pensive of, of the cemeteries. It's the way that we look at the world, ourselves, and then we identify ourselves and, and rationalize how we want to act, how we behave, how we form habits. And it's a very interesting cemetery, very deep, but we could almost spend the entire talk on handedness, but uh, I have too much to go through. So let's go through s some of the other ones. So glide reflection is like handedness, it's like the mirror reflection, but now you're translating there is no form of which this is actually, uh, it's, it's a, another form of, of symmetry. And, and nature, as you can see, uses this all the time. Go out today and look at all the plants and even human beings and, and look at some of these symmetries, how they're exposed in, in, in all this. Uh, I could go through a little bit more about the quasi-periodic types of symmetries. These are ones that are not fully symmetric in rotation or in translation. Uh, this is a Penrose tile developed, and it's unique. And often you can even find it very closely similar to some of the Islamic art and stuff in the way that it's formed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something intrinsic to geometry, but I'm not going to discuss it. But I do have some research that had actually some part of that. And time reversal is another form of symmetry, and we're going to see that today with music particularly. Time reversal in a conservative system like a pendulum or a planet orbiting a, plant, uh, a sun is, is time reversed in the sense that like if we look at exoplanets, these are planets that are far away from our own sun and we're now discovering thousands of them. You wouldn't know if it was the four billionth orbit of that planet. It might be the four billionth and one. The, in, the, in a sense, we can classically say those are time reversed states. The planet was essentially the same state it was a year ago. Um, uh, we use these same symmetries to define our fundamental laws of nature. This is an electron. It's assumed to be a point particle, one charge. But if there were a distribution of the charges within the electron, it would violate time symmetry because it wouldn't have the same uh, symmetry in terms of its spin if it was a dipole. Um, I'm not going to get into the fundamentals of this because I didn't want this to be a quantitative like talk. But the last one is the most profound, and we see this every day. We live it. It's the second law of thermodynamics. You can't unbreak an egg. None of us will look like we did when we were 16 years old. That's unfortunate, but that's part <laughs> of, of, of this, this, this time just moving forward. And that's one of those symmetries which I think is very profound to, to many of our lives. Now, there's some other ones too. And this is implicit symmetries. If I take a magnet and I have it in space without any fields, the magnet won't know what to do. It won't orient itself in any way. But if you apply a magnetic field, it could be somewhere very far away. The Earth's magnetic field, though weak, is very prevalent out to several order, out to the moon even. And yet this would orient, orientate itself with the field. That's called, uh, if you will, an implicit symmetry. You see this also in what's called phase transitions in physics. Above a certain temperature, things might be disordered and chaotic. And yet below that temperature, things freeze, or maybe they all fall in alignment into some order. And I, this is another very useful uh, symmetry here. I, I find that in general, we are in always a certain phase transition in our society. If you're in your shower, you're very likely to be naked. But you wouldn't come out in public naked, not necessarily. And you might also sing in the shower. But you don't often sing in public. The things we do in private are very different than the way we align ourselves to those ordered states in society. And there's, again, we could go, this could be the whole talk right here, too. I found this very interesting as I went through this. Now, this is the last physics slide in the talk. And I, I lost my, I forgot my little copper rod, but I brought a pinion uh, needle. I don't know if you can see it. 
but it's basically I'm trying to illustrate the same idea with this rod. An unbroken symmetry, it's just one dimension. Imagine it's cylindrically symmetric. Probably can't see it, but we'll, we'll use this as the example. The unbroken symmetry here is that this rod doesn't have any uh, measurable difference. If you look at it this way, this way, it's always the same. But if you were to force the rod over and bend it, you've now created an explicit symmetry breaking. This is something that's just mathematical, just, just a mathematical idea. Now the spontaneous symmetry breaking is when you take the rod and you crush it from both sides. It could bend out this way, it could bend out that way, it could bend out in any of the 360 degrees. We call that spontaneous symmetry breaking. The mathematical uh, machinery of this is exactly what, and you, some of you may have heard, and I'm not a high energy physicist, so I'm not gonna get into this, but basically it's the same idea that physicists used to develop the Higgs boson, which is the origin of all the baryonic matter, the, the protons, the neutrons, and even the electrons, which are leptons, <clears throat> in, in our universe. And uh, I don't claim to understand this theory, but it was necessary if, 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 if you were to have the theory work, it had to have the symmetry breaking. So the origin of all of us comes from a, a fundamental symmetry breaking in nature. And uh, there it is, uh, the, the theory said that that's how it had to be. If it didn't, the theory wouldn't have worked. You just have to trust me on that. Okay, I, I'm gonna leave these last two for later because they deal with some, some physics that I actually did as a graduate student, but we will come back to them if we want to. But I wanted to get to the human experience. How do we relate to the symmetries? Because as I, as I came into this talk, I didn't realize where I was going, but it, it started to uncover so much more than, than just the symmetries that physics gives us. This determined universe makes us behave in ways. It gives us the tools, as you see here. This is half a million years ago. We were making tools in Africa. And, and they were already being formed in very symmetric ways. Not because we maybe designed them that way, but somebody said, that's part of nature. And you, you make it, and it's the way that it pierces an animal best or your nearest neighbor. <laughs> and, um, and we also started to make art. And, and that art reflected upon the nature in which we were exposed to. And so we were, in, in many ways, this is a reflection upon the universe. Our first experiences were trying to describe what it was about the universe. And I find that very symmetric too. And of course, the places where we, we would live, or in this case, maybe honor gods. And it, you kind of have to ask yourself, I put two different slides here. And, what do you want to do with your life? And, and in some ways, you could just sit, relax, and enjoy it all, take it in. Or do you want to expose yourself to something, give back, and look upon the, the world as we, we continue to live, not just as ourselves, but as a civilization? Uh, I poured over, when I was very young, uh, Carl Sagan's book, The Cosmos. And this is a picture from it. It's the last perfect day. Don't worry, it won't occur for about three or four billion years from now. Um, but what do we want to do as a species until that day arrives? We have a lot of things to uncover. We have a lot of things that we could look at. And as symmetries are, are a wonderful thing. I mean, historically, I, I think of this, that the symmetry is, is one part and the broken symmetry is, is another part. But it's not quite that simple. I found it to be more something like this. Uh, I couldn't find a really good picture, but this is the one that I uh, thought of. Apollo and Dionysus. So Apollo is this god that the Greeks developed. And it was a god that embodied reason, calm, logical thinking, wisdom. And Dionysus, on the other hand, was this god that was chaotic, emotion, instinct, and impulse. And I find that the symmetry in the anti-symmetry, or the, the breaking of the symmetry, is very similar to this. And so as we go through, think of, think of that, that kind of dichotomy, if you will. So uh, art is really repetition, both in space and in time. And when we look at art, uh, I have some Islamic art, which I'm very fond of, 
And then, of course, the translational symmetry is clearly in an Escher painting. And then this wonderful uh, uh, pot by a, a man named Juan Casada, who's actually stayed at my house once, um, he, uh, he makes pottery in Mad there's, there's several symmetries just here in this pot. It's breaking symmetry. It's fighting against what? Against gravity. Gravity, you will never exit it unless you become an astronaut. <laughs> you will always fight gravity. And that's a very profound thing that, that I was attracted to these pots because I was studying at the time general relativity, which is the theory of gravity and stuff. And I thought, this is profound. These things really illustrate in non-linear, non-Euclidean geometry. This, there's a symmetry on the pot. There's three, three symmetries uh, around it if you go around it. But there's the, the, the symmetry it breaks to make itself stand up. Uh, I could talk about pots all day. I love them. Um, then there's fractals. You wouldn't think there's much symmetry here, but they are essentially symmetric, and I'll get to that in a, in a, in a minute. There's symmetry in music. There's repetition, and there's pa by b both pattern repetition and note repetition. Those are the two most fundamental. But there's also repetition in the way that music is, is being developed. This is a 40-year trend of music, and most of you probably are aware, at least I think I, you probably are, that music doesn't sound quite as innovative as it used to. <laughs> and I think that in the 60s, this was the, basically the height of innovation for music, in popular music at least. Um, <laughs> but, but today, it's, it's been shown. This is about 10,000 musical works. They're getting more repetitive and they're getting more compressed, both in, in lower dynamic range and everything. And we could go, again, I could talk a, a, a long time about this. Um, so when we, when we talk about those kinds of trends, why would society want music to be more repetitive? Well, let's, look, let's extend this out into a little bit. Um, I was recently made aware that uh, there are humpback whales in the South Pacific that can actually make a song that attracts, attracts their mates. And uh, they recently found that at least over two seasons, uh, maybe even three, that the songs, they'd find patterns in them. And the one song would get very picked up by the, by the, by the other whales and it would travel across the Pacific until that song became the popular song of that season <laughs> and attracted the most whales. This, this is very profound to me, at least. I didn't know that cultural transmission occurred in other species. And so here we have an example of maybe Justin Bieber whale. <laughs> and he goes across, and, and all of a sudden, all the whales are singing his song. And that's, that's outstanding in the sense that it's a relationship to, to our own needs and what may be simple to us. And uh, I'd like to point out that, well, I'll, I'll get to it in, in a minute um, after these two slides, that that kind of thing, keep in mind, is really important for us to have things which are familiar but different. And that, that's, that's a, a key. Because those songs, uh, I'll go back to, those songs aren't all that different each season, but they're a little different. And just like that pop song that gets the next uh, episode of the billion views on YouTube or whatever. So repetition is also used in mathematics. And I was talking about the fractals. They're more symmetric than you think. This entire leaf is mathematically constructed. We identify it as a leaf, and it looks like a leaf, but it's just a mathematical uh, 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 drawing. And it's created just by these 20 lines or so of code. And that's really remarkable because that's what allows a lot of your grandkids or kids to play video games, for example, because the computers don't have to store a lot of memory. They just have to compute things very fast. So the more GPUs, the sort of graphic processing units, the, the more they can create these artificial environments where it looks real to us, but it's just mathematics. So they're exploiting symmetries in this way. And we're going to see that with music as well. Now, I don't expect that any of you, if you've seen Ratatouille, that's Anton Ego, the, 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 the critic. Um, he doesn't look all that human, does he? But can anyone tell me what's special about these faces, these bedrooms, and these felids? 
They were all generated. None of those faces are real. Those are, none of those people are real. They are completely generated by a computer. Based on algorithms, that they, the neural nets that search a database of millions and millions of photos, because computers can do this. Um, you, you saw a good representation of it. These really do look real. And it's not just the photographs, it's also the music. And so I'm, I'm going to get to a really important point here. It's, we, we have the symmetries, they're part of nature. And we, we have to deal with them as a species. We've evolved to understand them, the, the repetitive nature of, of music, the things that we see that we like, that, that we see in nature. And we're starting to right now really uncover a lot of things about, because of computers, we can have algorithms that kind of set ourselves to the things that we like the most. It's a competition too, because it can just be not just the, the, the computers, it's the people. There are recipes. People, like I said, when you're defining that repetition in music, it's because people have found out what people like, and they keep on using it and endorsing it in that way. This, this uh, piece of art is completely generated by a computer. Uh, this, this piece of art is, is very familiar to most of you, and you can actually buy an oil painting of most of the paintings that are very famous to us all, and they can be 3D printed and they can be generated in ways which uh, resemble or are identical for most classical purposes to the real thing. Now, I have another uh, piece here, two, two actually. Um, one of them is kind of obscure, but I, of the four or five pieces I've read on, on music and how it, it, it is something like an algorithm, uh, one of the first studies was, was really interesting. It analyzed about 16,000 pieces of all the music known, and it said, what would people really like? And uh, one of the pieces of music, uh, it turns out, I didn't bring it today, but everyone who heard it said it sounded just like this. And I think you might be able to hear this. <laughs> Can you hear that? How many of you don't recognize this? Oh. So apparently, that's what that music sounded like. And you might wonder, that's an interesting thing, because I like the song, of course, but I never would have thought it would have been something that we would have all, as an algorithm, it just identified a piece of music that we're already familiar with. And that's, the, again, it's this expression of how we like and respond to things is often a very hard mixture of the things that we want to be familiar with, safe, calm, logical, like Apollo, and the things we want to be different. And I, I was struck, my kids listen to newer music, 21 Pilots is here. They have a, a line in one of their lyrics that says, I want to, to essentially, I'd like to write something that uh, notes that have never been heard before. And in, in, in essence, they're trying to identify that innovative, that algorithm that seeks the numinous. Unfortunately, today, doesn't it feel a lot like algorithms that are searching to find the zeitgeist, which I think is a lot more pedestrian. It's something that we're not fighting to find the most intimate and most amazing song ever written, like Beethoven's Ninth, but it's just next day's hit wonder. And that often is what you're finding today with both art and music. Now, we talked about this. Let's go back a little bit to the symmetry. Symmetry is not actually that interesting to a lot of us. And uh, in, in our very distant future, it's hypothesized that the universe itself will just sort of end in a heat death, meaning that you know, brown dwarfs will just be equally spaced throughout the entire universe. Nobody will be able to speak to each other. There, there will be uh, no, it will be completely isotropic. And when, when we say isotropic, we mean no way to have information. There will be no more energy left. It'll just be a, a, a black dwarf or a brown dwarf with another one, another one. And wherever you look, it looks the same. So symmetry in itself is, is abhorrent to aesthetics. We don't like it fully in its, in its full uh, uh, measure. Just like, if, and we'll get to this in a second, you wouldn't want to have every day on a wonderful grassy field. I mean, maybe you would. Some of you could. Um, I guarantee you after a few months, 
you might want to go to the beach. <laughs> so um, another aspect to this is symmetry isn't just one or zero or everything the same. It could be random. You flip a coin, it could be one or zero. But over the time, you flip a bazillion coins, the average will be half. And the information there isn't very useful to us. So random things are themselves isotropic, even though they're not the same. And I, I actually wanted to do a study, two of my favorite works, Pride and Prejudice and Hamlet. I did, a, I did an analysis of all the letters, and I found that Hamlet has 52.9 ones percent if you convert it to binary. And then Pride and Prejudice has 52, 53.0 you know, ones. Uh, and you think, well, they're not the same works. Uh, yet, but as an information point of view, it's really fascinating that they're almost identical. Can anyone say why it wouldn't be exactly 50% ones and zeros? Do we use all the letters equally the same in the human language? No. Does anyone know what one of the top four letters are? And they're way much higher than all the other letters. E. e. But E isn't the biggest. Uh, no, S, S didn't make T and O. Yeah, R, R is not quite there. He's still like in the second raft of. But I, I found that fascinating. Um, so the origin of real interesting things comes from this breaking. It really does. Uh, this is from Sean Carroll's book, uh, The Big Picture. Uh, also, Minute Physics was developed as a YouTube. You should watch it. It's a guy at the Primer, Perimeter Institute in Canada. Um, basically, it says, how is it that the universe starts from very low entropy and then goes up to higher entropy? How can there be complex things? There's often uh, the people battle, like, how is it that humans exist here when entropy is always supposed to be increasing? Well, um, so there are interesting things. It's because as entropy goes up, you can create more complex things. But as entropy goes too high, like I said, in the heat death of the universe, the entropy is the highest. Well, everything's homogenized. There's no more way to have information. So the real critical time, and we're living in it, is that we get to have complex things. So when you think of the origin of the universe, it's like milk and coffee unmixed. But as you mix them, what happens? you get these turbulent forms, and that's where everything that's interesting, because you can't, you can't translate it, you can't turn it upside down. It's not the same as it was if you rotate it. It's completely complex in this sense. And yet, as you, as you mix your milk and your coffee completely together, what happens? The entropy has gone completely up, but it's uninteresting, because everywhere you look, it's the same. And so that, that's a fascinating feature about about our, our, our universe. The next two slides, I think, are the most important slides in the entire talk. The first is differentiability. Now, this is the only political slide I'm going to have in this talk. <laughs> now, you see it in, in the symmetry of society. Now, society could be completely homogenous. But we've, I, I think so human beings have identified what happens when you do too much homogeneity. North Korea is kind of an example of this today. You don't like complete homogeneity. But what's the alternative? A hammer? It, there might be one hammer and nails, as an analogy, like the, the Simon and Garfunkel song. What would you rather be? My sons always love that when I play that for them. Um, and you have to think, well, what can we do? Well, my favorite, uh, possibly all-time philosopher, his name was John Rawls. He was a political philosopher. And he identified an interesting uh, hypothetical example. It's called the original position, if you will. Imagine you're on this side of an unknown bearer and you want to create a society. How would you create it? You don't know who you're going to be. You could be a minority. You could be homosexual. You could be religious. You could be non-religious. You don't know what those, those forms are going to be like. How would you create the laws of your society based on this hypothetical situation? And this is a profound example of trying to treat all three of these differentiability problems and, and, and maybe solve it at, at the best. This is the best example I can think of to solving that problem. So the, the second one, this is the second most important slide in the, in the talk, 
is distinguishability. This is on the personal level. Remember that reflection, that most pensive of all the, the cemeteries? You looking at yourself and what do you want? I bet you most of you are familiar with Dr. Seuss and the Sneetches, the belly starred Sneetches and the ones that didn't have the stars. If you recall in the end of that story, does anyone remember what happened? The, the, the person essentially identified that they, they, they were running in and out of both of the machines and nobody could tell at the end who was who. Um, and, and it's an interesting thing about this, this homogeneity that we both want to get away from. We want to be individual, but we also want to be like everyone else. And who's the camp? Who's us? Who's them? Uh, I, as a, so I was a swimmer at Stanford, and we had what was called a Mohawk principle. Now, a Mohawk principle is very simple. Imagine all of you today going and getting a Mohawk and dyeing your hair pink. Would you be distinguished by your peers? Most of you would. You would be noticed by people, pedestrians in the street. Now, contrast that with writing Pride and Prejudice, with writing The Origin of Species, with maybe writing a, a symphony like Beethoven's Ninth, with potentially swimming across the pool faster than any human being has ever done in history. Would you be distinguished? Both of these will distinguish you, but in different ways. And I find th that, that Mohawk principle is, is a very interesting thing to apply to your daily habits as you move through life. You say, is this something that actually distinguishes me in this way or this way? It's hard. Everybody knows it's hard to get here. Everybody knows it's hard to get on a boat and travel halfway across the ocean to the Galapagos and make a new theory for our entire species. That's very difficult. Um, but these, these, these things you see in our society today. So we talked about the grass, remember? Sitting on the grass every day. Well, it turns out that we don't like things to be the same all the time either. And uh, I, I, I read this uh, very weird thing a couple of years ago that um, when they were trying to serve some indentured servants in Massachusetts, lobster, the, the, the servants sued the owners. They didn't want the lobster more than three times a week. Now, my favorite food is sushi and pizza. I could have it maybe a month, but after a month, <laughs> I guarantee you I'd want some enchiladas. And uh, it's just the way that we are. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen these memes online, but they're, they're getting quite prolific. I've captured about 50 different kinds. It's a distracted boy looking at, obviously, another girl. Now, you would think most of them would be about infidelity or something, but the vast majority of these themes have to do with what it is I should be doing and what it is I'd rather be doing. And it's almost always coming from people who are writers, or, or, or composers, and uh, you see this often. It's a very good illustration about this, this symmetry, and, but also the same thing about what we want, and yet it could be right there, but it's, it's similar to what we have. As far as I'm concerned, these two girls are identically attractive, yet to this person, maybe at that one moment, they're not. And it's a fascinating uh, feature. So this is a historical society. So the second to last slide. <laughs> I, I love this one. I can only name one person. I don't know. Can anyone? I, I know Elizabeth's mom. That's Anne Boleyn. So there. So he had six wives, I guess. You know, this, this is the moral pillar of Protestant England, right? Uh, so does anybody else know any of the other wives? I was wondering if, if there's Catherine, Catherine Jane, Jane. Anne who? Anne Parr. Par? Okay. Two oh, two hands, yeah. I think it wasn't Jane, Jane was, there was a Jane. Yes, Seymour, yeah. yeah. So uh, th th this is a wonderful illustration of, uh, of that. What? Okay. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the, the last one survived, correct? Oops. Correct. Oh, dear. The last one survived. So this is the last slide. Um, so basically, I see I'm a philosopher and I'm very hard 
or determinist, but I'm also a compatibilist. And when you, you don't know what those words mean, it's talking about free will. And uh, because I'm a physicist, I think that our choices are determined. But I want you to align this one simple idea in your life as you make choices, that they are determined. But imagine, well, you don't have to imagine. I think this is Apollo, deterministic life. This is Dionysus. Now, what makes a stochastic model really stochastic is that it's supposed to be random, right? But we're not sort of Marvel superheroes. We can't jump 10 meters off the ground. That's prohibited by the laws of physics. That's why I think that determinism is important for you to recognize. The laws of symmetry apply to you just like they do to everyone else. And you have to follow them. But you get to choose in the sense that this is my, the more compatibilist part of me. Is it, that's, does anyone know what this is on the right? There's a name for this kind of puzzle. It's a marble that gets tracked around. It's called a Rube Goldberg. A Rube Goldberg is kind of illustrated best by like dominoes. The most simplest domino, you can have a million dominoes. It only takes the first domino to fall. And then all the others go. It's completely determined. It's deterministic. But could you arrange those dominoes in any order you want? Of course. And in fact, if your kids have ever done it or you've done it, You've, you've probably arranged it in a spiral. You've arranged it so maybe it can have a hard 90 degree turn. You get to decide how this Rube Goldberg is made. It's fully determined. You use the symmetry laws. You get to decide what music you get to listen to, what art you like. But they are determined. But it makes life a lot more stochastic feeling than just deterministic. But it's a combination of these things that ultimately we have to live with. And I, I, I have one personal I, idea that is thought, uh, I've thought of as I wrote this a lot, is that I have in my own life um, uh, the possibility that I might get Parkinson's, for example. My grandfather died of it, and my mom might have it, and I might get it, and it's genetic. But I know that with research, they've said, oh, well, if you exercise, that helps. And I know two or three people at the lab who have Parkinson's, and they exercise every day. We, I see each at the pool. And I say, this is one of those things that I make a small decision that changes my life. It's a small thing, but maybe it will help me. And these are the things that as you go through life, and you exploit the fact that everything is determined by these laws of symmetry and stuff, you still have some ability to make small decisions to change the way you, the outcomes of your own life and those of around you. So I think that that's about all. Uh, if you had questions.